number seven fifth. So we're going to start with Rialto, do the SAC regional, and I think that takes care of what most of you are here for. If that fouls somebody up, I sincerely apologize. I can see one now. <laughs> What's that? Let's get underway. I do have a legislative rep here from Senator Gloria Negretti McLeod, Brent Williams that's going to go first before we even have the staff presentation on Rialto. Hello. Go ahead. Thank you for letting me uh, present on behalf of uh, Senator McLeod. So thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board for letting me speak on behalf of Senator McLeod. The Senator asked me to convey her appreciation on your continued work in the Rialto, Colton, Fontana Basin, and she looks forward to the day that the water will actually begin to get cleaned up. She is pleased to see that all the re responsible parties are in the process of preparing preliminary settlements or have submitted them to the court. Th this is certainly a positive development after 15 years of waiting and hundreds of millions of dollars in legal, fe legal fees spent. The preliminary agreements are a positive step, but there are still issues that could delay the cleanup of the, of the water. <clears throat> Excuse me. As your board hears the settlement agreements, the senator is asking you to resolve all uh, contingencies that could unnecessarily delay the timely cleanup in the basin. The use of water rights is one example. Um, I've spoken with reps from the Fontana Water Company who have some uh, issues as well. And this is why the senator is asking the state board to stay involved to help bring this long-standing issue to a speedy resolution. Uh, Senator McLeod will be moving on to Congress in January, but looks forward to continuing her work to clean up perchlorate at uh, both the state and federal levels. And she thanks your board for your continued uh, work on this issue. Thank you, Brent. Thanks. Tom, while you were gone, we kind of reversed orders on things. Would you introduce item number 12, please? Also, we- And do we, we have staff for it, or? Give her our congratulations. Yes. Will do, thank you very much. Mr. Howard is stepping aside, and um, there was not going to be much of a uh, staff presentation uh, shortly. Karen O'Hare and James Herrink will be joining us briefly on the Rialto item. All of the board members are familiar with this item. The State Water Board uh, commenced a proceeding a number of years ago uh, because of stalled efforts by the Santa Ana Water Board to conduct an adjudicative proceeding related to a cleanup and abatement order uh, for a 160-acre site in Rialto, California. Um, those proceedings were stayed by various judicial um, orders and then ultimately all of the judicial litigation was resolved and the State Board commenced its proceeding. Uh, during that time, however, the parties uh, uh, under what I will call the animating force of the U.S. Department of Justice had a number of apparent settlement meetings and over the last six months since this board last had an update on the Rialto item, a number of uh, documents have been filed with the Federal District Court in the Central District of California that indicate that at least the U.S. Department of Justice's uh, circle of proceeding on behalf of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has proceeded to a point where there is a party, the MHART parties, who will be overseeing the work group and the implementation of an interim remedy. And only within the last month or so, we have heard that the uh, Goodrich Corporation will be the work party for a long-term remedy at the Rialto 160-acre site. 
The Santa Ana Water Board throughout this time has been uh, the Water Board's lead, if you will, prosecutor with respect to pursuing cleanup at the site at Kurt Birchtold. Their executive officer is here today. Um, and the Santa Ana Board, in conjunction with the Office of Enforcement, has been working um, in conjunction with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the potentially responsible parties, as well as the cities of Rialto and Colton, who have been prosecuting their own circle of causes of action against the potentially responsible parties. And have uh, Mr. Birchtold and Mr. Kerrigan, with the Office of Enforcement, have brought forward uh, model settlement agreements that will be um, ultimately considered by the Santa Ana Board. I believe they've authorized their executive officer to sign those documents. And what you have before you today is a resolution that would propose to authorize the Chief Deputy, John Bishop, to approve and nego well, to negotiate and enter into settlement agreements that would resolve the state claims with respect to the Rialto site. Um, we have circulated in advance of this board meeting a form of settlement agreement that would be used um, as a model, we expect, for a number of the parties. Uh, that settlement agreement concerns the uh, Pyro Spectaculars, uh, potentially responsible party, and a number of other parties. Um, as I said, I expect that that would provide the form of settlement agreement for the other state claims and the other potentially responsible parties as those uh, federal consent decrees move closer to completion. Uh, today we've asked for parties to comment on these settlements and in particular what I will ask before the various stakeholders come forward today is most of the comments that the board had received were favorable to the settlement agreement. However, we received a number of, well, we received some pointed comments from the Fontana Water Company. Um, those were submitted uh, under the letterhead of the San Gabriel Valley Water Company, which is its parent company, I believe. Uh, concerned that some of the prior claims that they have asserted against the potentially responsible parties uh, should not be released or forgiven in any kind of state settlement agreement that the regional board and the state board may enter into. And so I would ask all of the parties uh, to address the comments from the Fontana Water Company, San, San Gabriel Valley Water Company, and specifically the limitation that they pr um, indicate was contained in a prior settlement, state settlement uh, involving the county of San Bernardino. So with that, uh, I do not know uh, if the parties have coordinated their presentations. Uh, I would expect that we would hear first from Kurt Birchtold on behalf of the Santa Ana Board unless we have uh, uh, a panel presentation that's going to come up. Good afternoon. I'm Kurt Birchtold, the Executive Officer for the Santa Ana Regional Water Board. And I'll be very brief. I just wanted to express the Regional Board's support for the resolution that's before you today. Um, we would support adoption of that resolution. And if you adopt that resolution, we would look forward to working with the Chief Deputy Director to finalize settlement agreements in this matter that would move the cleanup forward. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, the one about Fontana. Uh, yeah, it, it, Fontana is concerned that they will, um, if these settlement agreements are concluded, that they will um, not have an opportunity to pursue their, their own concerns. And uh, so what, what will the regional board or what can the regional board consider doing to, uh, for example, like Hola, a meeting in Fontana with, with the folks that are there. Well, I, I think what Fontana specifically was requesting in their letter was that um, that their perchlorate affected wells be excluded from the matters addressed by the settlement. Uh, and the, the regional board would not oppose making such an amendment to the settlement and we would be happy to work with Fontana and the chief deputy director as part of moving the settlements forward to address that issue. Okay, thank you, Kurt. John Van Vleer. It, it would help if people turned in cards. I may look clairvoyant, but I'm not. I apologize, Chair Hoffman. I just wanted to, to mention very briefly that 
Uh, Mr. Wayne Praskins and Ms. Michelle Benson from US EPA are also here uh, in case the board has any questions that they may want to level to US EPA. Okay. I just wanted to make sure the board was aware of that fact. Okay, thanks. Mr. Van Blair. I don't have a clue who wants to talk on behalf of the parties. All I have is these cards, so. Okay, sorry about that confusion. Generally, even uh, parties, we expect to submit a card, but if the, uh, if the PRPs have a panel group that they'd like to bring up. Yeah, I mean, it's we, fine to do it. Yeah. I just and then what we can have them do is submit cards afterwards. And if it's easier, if you have a coordinated presentation, Mr. Zagon, um, Mr. Herring and Ms. O'Hare can move away and all of you can sit at the table, or if you prefer, you can do uh, Seriatim presentations at the podium. Right, right here is fine with me, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies to you no, and the board. Mind you, I, my, I, my, my name is Brian Zagon. I am counsel for Pyrospectaculars and Astropyrotechnics. They are two of the settling parties that are in the first settlement group. They are parties to the settlement agreement that uh, I would say is beyond a form agreement at this point. It's what was attached to Mr. Lawfer's November 13 notice letter. It is a settlement agreement before you, and after lengthy protracted negotiations, it has been signed by all parties uh, except on behalf of the State Board. Uh, that would include um, uh, on behalf of the Regional Board by Mr. Birchtold, who just spoke. Um, I'll just go right to, uh, right to the Fontana issue, since there is universal support for this agreement. Uh, 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 other than from Fontana and I guess to a lesser respect from West Valley Water District, which I'll address as, as well. Um, it is very clear in the settlement agreement before you that the rights of any party who is not a party to that settlement agreement are not affected in any way. We were very careful to include language to that effect in the agreement itself. Fontana's right, Fontana Water Company's rights are not impacted in any way by that settlement agreement. They are free to file whatever claims they want yesterday, today, or the day after today, and most, most importantly, the day after hopefully the settlement agreement is approved. And why do I say that? If you look at paragraph 17D in the settlement agreement, it says, Nothing in this administrative settlement agreement provides a contribution bar under CERCLA or otherwise to settling parties. Okay. Then it goes on to make it crystal clear. In addition, settling parties, that's my clients, Trojan and the Peters parties, and Stonehurst Site LLC. In addition, settling parties do not intend and agree that they will not seek a contribution bar under CERCLA or otherwise based on this administrative settlement agreement. So what does that mean? That means we've promised, not only have we affirmatively stated this is, the settlement does not act as a bar, we've promised we're not going to claim it's a bar. So Fontana Waters claim that somehow its rights are impacted is just plain wrong. Okay. Now I want to turn to the language they propose to be added to the settlement agreement. In the cleanup and abatement order, draft cleanup and abatement order that was the operative pleading for the state board proceeding against my client Goodrich and Emhart, it included allegations with respect to certain Fontana Water Company wells. In discovery, we learned that there was no evidence to support that. An amended pleading was to be filed, and in fact, a new pleading was to be filed once the proceeding restarted. That's never happened. Okay? We are not going to accept a settlement that is half a loaf. We want a full loaf. We're paying a lot of money for a global settlement, both in the federal court proceedings, the Colton state court proceeding, and to be relieved of any exposure on the various state regulatory proceedings. That is what we're paying for. That is what we bargained for. We will not accept a reduction in the matters addressed language that is in that settlement agreement. 
And this is a huge issue that goes beyond my clients because it also impacts, my, my clients are in the first consent decree. It's been lodged with the federal court. Public comment period has been completed. There were no comments to our consent decree. The United States informed us today that they're going to file a motion for entry of that consent decree with the federal court on January, by January 23rd, at which point when that consent decree is entered, we will pay money towards the interim remedy, towards reimbursement uh, of response costs for the cities of Rialto and Colton, the county of San Bernardino, and the regional board. The other two consent decrees, which are the work decrees, the MHART decree was lodged this morning, and they are the work party for the interim remedy. And as you've been told by Mr. Lawford, Goodrich is discussing their, their language of a consent decree with the United States to be lodged sometime in the near future. Okay. This relief in the form of this settlement agreement that is before you is equally, if not more important, to those parties as well. And what Fontana wants is not acceptable. And it is not acceptable because it changes what we bargain for and quite clearly, this agreement, if you look at Section 17D, does not impact Fontana's water's rights. And the bottom line is, these cases and this, these regulatory proceedings for the RAS, perchlorate, and TCE issues has been going on for almost a decade. Fontana Water has only sued West Coast Loadings and the Emhart parties in federal court for a very, very short period of time, at which point they dismiss their case. They have not filed a claim or filed a suit against any other party. And I know evidence was presented to you verbally in July, and I'll just restate it. It is the position of both EPA, in letters from Mr. Uh, Praskins, who's here, as well as in EPA's response to Fontana Water's comments to, de, to the 2010 record of decision for the BF Goodrich site, that there is no evidence that perchlorate from the 160-acre parcel area has migrated to any of Fontana Water Company's wells. So not only do they have no rights, pardon me, let me misstate, misstate that. Nothing in the settlement agreement impacts their rights. They haven't acted on whatever rights they have. Thank you. Actually, I should ask if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sankar. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. I am John Van Vleer, and I did submit a card. Um, and uh, uh, you're okay, my, then, John. Yeah, you're lucky. My, uh, my, my clients, Tom Peters, the Peters Trust, and Stonehurst Site LLC are on this first PSI consent uh, uh, settlement agreement and consent decree. Um, number one, I, I support the comments that my co-counsel, Mr. Zagon, made. Number two, um, I wanted to make sure that it's clear that timing on this is important and any delays at this point have an impact on some of the practical implications, specifically with respect to the Stonehurst site that I'm involved with. There's going to be a cap put on the Stonehurst site. Construction for the site um, d it can't happen during the rainy season, and that's in the settlement agreement. So the non-rainy season starts in April. Okay, so if we get any kind of extensive delays, it may push us into the middle of that rainy season, which could kick the cap construction an entire year. And we want to avoid that happening. We got the money in place, we want to do the cap, we want to, we want to get it built, and we, we want to avoid any extra delay. So what we would s deem as a renegotiation of the agreement that is signed by everybody except for the state board at this point um, to include Fontana language that is just really irrelevant to what this deal is that's in front of you guys um, would bring in the potential of that delay and we just want to avoid that. Um, And the last thing is with respect to West Valley's comments, just real briefly, um, they basically say, hold up their hand and say, hey, we've got water rights, we can do this remedy, et cetera. That 
potentially, and I'll say even potentially, might apply to the second or third consent decrees, but not to this one. This is a cash out consent decree. We're not doing any work. We're just paying money. It's going to the cities. It's going to the remedies. So whatever West Valley's issues are, it really doesn't belong in, 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 in this first settlement agreement that's in front of you. Thank you very much. And do you have any questions? We're good. Thanks, John. Any of the other parties? Uh, good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Jim Meter, and I represent the Emhart parties, and I also did submit a card. Um, I, I'm done with my tirade. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background. Uh, Brian Zagon, on behalf of PSI, covered most of it. Uh, address very briefly the Fontana comment, and then a, a, address very briefly the, the West Valley Water uh, District comments. Um, my clients are the Emhart parties, Black & Decker, Inc., Emhart Industries, Inc., and Kwikset Locks, Inc. We have uh, uh, decided uh, to resolve this matter uh, in what we think is the appropriate way and move forward uh, as the work party to perform the work to build what is called the interim remedy. And the interim remedy is a remedy whereby we uh, will, will install some capture extraction wells very close to where the county's existing system is uh, to capture and contain and remove mass of perchlorate and TCE coming off the 160-acre site. We're going to be in the Rialto Colton groundwater basin for the next 30 years, most likely, doing that. So we have a real interest in working with all of the parties in the basin to make sure that the remedy works. And as soon as it's finished and done, we can close it up and move on to other things. Um, in connection with our obligations, we have signed up to take some of the settlement monies that have been collected in the consent decree uh, that my parties are, uh, my clients are signatories to, which was lodged this morning in the federal district court, um, and to use those monies for the exclusive purpose of the remedy, and when those monies run out, run out to use our own money to finish it. In connection with that consent decree and our implementation of EPA's 2010 interim remedial record of decision, um, we have also agreed to enter into implementation agreements where I think in the submission that I sent to the board a couple of days ago uh, with the city of Rialto, they're going to operate the system. Um, there is some talk of even the uh, West Valley Water District becoming the contractor to the city of Rialto to operate the system. Um, the city of Colton uh, is providing us the necessary water rights, we believe. Uh, and we will deliver the treated water to the city of Colton through the city of Rialto's <coughs> existing infrastructure. We also have started preliminary negotiations and discussions with West Valley Water District about the potential need for additional water rights to make sure we can continue to do the remedy. Um, and those have gone well. Um, it's very important to appreciate that with the signing of the consent decree, on October 10 of this year, we commenced, even though it's not lodged and it's not become a final order of the district court yet, the Emhart parties commenced the groundwater modeling next necessary to select exactly the size and shape of the remedy. We've commenced the remedial design work and we have just begun the discussions with Rialto and Colton and the county with regard to implementation agreements so we can implement it all together. And we've had several meetings with West Valley. Um, there are groups of technical people who include all of those parties and the consultants that the Emhart parties uh, have retained who are meeting regularly and gathering up information about the groundwater uh, conditions in terms of the historical data so the modeling exercise can be done efficiently. We've made it very clear in the course of that process that the groundwater model we're going to generate is not proprietary. And it will be used and can be used when it's completed 
um, by anyone who wants to use it uh, for whatever purpose they need to do. We've also uh, agreed that uh, we have biweekly meetings with Mr. Praskins at EPA with regard to the modeling exercises. All the, uh, the players who have been participating in that dialogue uh, have been invited to participate in those uh, calls and meetings with Mr. Praskin. So we're trying to keep an, an open book here for one very simple reason. We want to do it right the first time, get it done, get it built, turn it on, and make sure it works. Now, with regard to the consent decree that we have, uh, which was lodged today, the lodging means it's just notified, notice is sent to the court and a copy is made public. The next step there for our consent decree is it's published in the Federal Register. A comment period with regard to it is allowed. After the comment period closes, an EPA responds to any comments. Uh, motions, uh, if appropriate, will be made in the district court uh, for the entry of the decree when it, and then it becomes final. Until it becomes final by entry by the district court, no monies are funded to do this work. No monies are paid in until all of the consent decree uh, obligations are approved by the district court. So one of the things that's important is that we move as expeditiously as we can. And just, just so you know, Emhart and my clients have agreed to undertake to fund their own, the work that they're doing now subject to the bet that the consent decree will go final um, because we think it's important enough and EPA asks us to do that. Um, one of the conditions that we discussed at length with EPA and Mr. Kerrigan uh, on behalf of the Office of Enforcement was that we wanted by making the commitments we have made to resolve not only all of our issues with EPA within the confines of the consent decree but all of our issues with the State of California State Water Resources Control Board and the Regional Board. And it has been our understanding uh, from our discussions in July and our discussions recently uh, in preparation for this meeting that the purpose of today's meeting is to pass a resolution, hopefully, that will direct the, the chief, uh, the assistant chief, the, the assistant director of the uh, State Water Research Control, Control Board to negotiate a settlement agreement which will memorialize from our perspective the second half of our settlement which is a resolution with the Office of Enforcement and the State Water Resources Control Board and the Regional Board all claims that relate to whatever obligations we may have in the future uh, and today or in the past with regard to the 160 acre site and the historical activity of uh, predecessors to my clients. It is important to understand with regard to Fontana that Fontana did sue my clients in 2007. In 2008 in federal district court, the district court judge there entered an order setting the case for trial in 2009 at the end of 2009 and that necessarily triggered a whole series of obligations to come forward with evidence and expert witnesses and all that sort of stuff. Within 30 to 40 days of that order, Fontana dismissed its lawsuit and walked away from the litigation voluntarily. Didn't call us up and say we want to try to settle with you, they just dismissed their lawsuit and walked away. That suggested something to us. In 2009, when uh, the federal lawsuits, after a Herculean effort to try to settle them all, failed, were all refiled, Fontana brought no new claims against anybody in federal court. They could have if they had wanted to, I assume. They didn't bring any. In 2009 and 2010, the EPA, as you know, undertook to do an investigation after listing the site as a Superfund site and undertook uh, to promulgate a interim remedy and identified it and selected it. And in the course of the identification and selection of that, uh, Fontana Water Company submitted 23 separate comments, 
asserting that what was coming from the 160-acre site and from the county landfill areas was somehow impacting their wells. I will only say this about those comments. EPA responded to them all, did not change in any way the remedy that they selected with regard to what needed to be done. And the remedy that they selected with regard to our obligations is to address the contaminants of concern, which are the perchlorate and uh, I think there's four other contaminants actually that have been identified in the rod uh, that are coming off the 168 acre site to capture and as best we can contain them until the final remedy is implemented. And you'll hear maybe later today from others about that because another party has now signed up to do that. Our bargain was to do what EPA asked us to do and what EPA identified in the interim rod. As I look at that rod and I look at the comments, it does not address the Fontana wells because the Fontana wells are not impacted by the 160-acre site or, as I understand it, the Unit 5 of the, uh, the Mid Valley uh, Sanitary Landfill. The settlement we're asking to negotiate that the resolution addresses with the uh, Deputy Director of the State Water Resources Control Board is a settlement of the claims of the Office of Enforcement. Any prosecutor who might want to prosecute us before the Regional Board or the State Board arising out of the Water Code, which are the subject of the 2009 uh, order of this Board uh, to direct its chair and, and its uh, executive director to select a hearing officer, which we're trying to resolve now. In our understanding, Fontana Water Company is not and has not been a party to this proceeding in the sense that it had a claim that this board would address. If Fontana has claims for damages, uh, they had an opportunity in the past to do so. They elected not to pursue those. Whatever opportunities remain for the future outside of this forum, they're free to do. There's a federal district court down the street. There's a federal district court in Los Angeles. There are state courts throughout this state. And for whatever reasons, and I think I know what they are, Fontana has not asked to do that uh, or not undertaken to do that. So in our view, it is really important that we, as part of our global settlement here, not only wrap up our obligations with the EPA and the United States, but we wrap them up with the State Board so we can proceed to implement, as we have already commenced, uh, the remedy that will hope solve this problem uh, for the citizens of Rialto and Colton and the Basin in the future. I thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Just one comment, Mr. Meter, and to the, the other parties' counsel as well. I must be mellowing as I age because for some reason I enjoyed your presentations a lot more today than I had in past occasions. I don't know what the difference is. I think it's the sense of the direction in which we're going. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Height, Ryan Height. Is that it for the parties? Peter, were you a party or? I'm just f flying by the seat of my pants here that are. Well, uh, you want to go first and I'll, I'll come in after you. All right. <laughs> Defer to Mr. Weiner and then I'll go after him. We'll have duty. All right, all right. Here we go. Uh, uh, Chairman Hoppen, uh, my name is Ryan Height. I represent the West Valley Water District. Um, I'm supplementing the comments that we submitted uh, in writing last week. and. Uh, it will be short. Um, basically, the West Valley Water District supports the uh, proposed resolution uh, generally, uh, but we just wanted to point out, and we did this in a little bit more detail in the letter that we submitted, that um, the one thing that we think the uh, appointment of the chief deputy will really be helpful in is looking at the water rights issue and how water rights are being allocated for the implementation of the of the interim and final remedies. Um, the West Valley Water District is the largest water rights holder in the area, uh, and most likely the remedy and the parties that are uh, implementing the remedy are going to require uh, some of West Valley Water District's water rights to do that work. Um, and we feel that the allocation for this work should be addressed and resolved prior to 
the finalization of this agreement and other agreements like it so that the parties don't go too far down the road and then realize that they don't have a proper allocation of water rights. And if the water district hasn't prepared that and uh, worked that out uh, in advance, there may not be that option down the road if they get to it in two or three years. Uh, that could jeopardize all of the work that all of these parties have done and it makes no sense to the West Valley Water District to not have that issue addressed now and we think the Chief Deputy uh, Director uh, is in a great position to look at that issue, work on that with the EPA. Uh, the West Valley Water District, Water District has offered to uh, provide information on that and help out uh, with uh, guiding uh, how that uh, issue could be resolved before the uh, settlement is uh, finalized. Um, it's, a, uh, it's probably one of the biggest components to the implementation of the remedy, uh, having the water rights to pull out of the ground to clean up the water. You, you can't just do that. You have to have the proper allocation. So it's not just another issue. It's, we, we, we deem it as a critical issue. And if you're planning on doing a remedy for 30 years, you really need to think about how you're going to allocate the water rights under contract uh, before you start down that road. One of my colleagues likes to say that all these parties are getting into a car and they're going to New York City and they're going to stay in an apartment for a couple of months, but they're not going to bring the key. They're, they're going to get to New York and they're going to say, where's the key? And here, that's the water rights. They need to deal, get that key before they leave on this big trip they're going down. So I just want to leave you with that thought that uh, the uh, deputy director is in a great position to look at that issue and we strongly support the efforts that, that have been made here between all the parties and we think this, res this uh, settlement's a great advancement in, these, uh, in the resolution of all these proceedings. We just think this one issue really needs to be addressed. Uh, we look forward to uh, the board taking that on. Thank you, Mr. Knight. All right, thank you. Karen or James, Michael, uh, Previous speakers talked about the arrangements they had made for water rights. Are you comfortable that this issue has been resolved or is it yet to be flushed out? Uh, we've heard two different things. You will recall that largely your advisory staff are a blank slate on a number of these issues. So the water, the extent of the water rights issues, um, our knowledge is pretty much limited to the comment letters that have been presented by Mr. Height. Um, the resolution that's before you, um, as is correctly pointed out by the West Valley Water District, does have the authority for the chief deputy to negotiate on some of these provisions. And those are issues that we may want to roll up our sleeves a little bit and hear uh, both from the, the potentially responsible parties, um, or I should say at this point, the settling parties and West Valley. And I, I think that's something we would try to work through and make sure we have a fuller understanding uh, because since our proceedings stopped, essentially we're not receiving the relative regular flow of information and we've been relying in large part on the Santa Ana Water Board to continue pursuing the state's interests, if you will, in this lawsuit. Peter. Chairman Hoppen and uh, members of the board, Peter Weiner on behalf of the city of Rialto. I'd first like to, as a former chief deputy director myself, I'd like to recognize the appropriate title for Mr. Bishop. Um, it's very important. Um, I want to clarify uh, one thing first in, to get to the conclusion, and then I want to go back to the beginning. What's before you today is a resolution. The resolution would authorize the chief deputy director to enter into settlement negotiations with settling parties. That applies to the PSI settlement. It applies to the MHART settlement. They're different. You would be authorizing both, and presumably, if there were a Goodrich settlement or any other settlement, you would be authorizing for that as well. We applaud and support that resolution. That's, that is necessary, we believe, for you to do today to authorize the Chief Deputy Director so that we can make progress on that issue. The history of this is long, uh, occasionally sordid, and certainly intense. Um, City of Rialto was at the forefront of impact and at the forefront of fighting for clean water for its citizens. And together with Colton, both cities filed lawsuits early not exactly often, but, but early, uh, to try to get resolution of this. We implored both EPA and the Regional Water Board and then the State Board 
to help us with that. And we are very pleased at the end of almost a decade that this matter seems to be coming to a conclusion. The city remains ground zero, the city of Rialto, because most of the contamination is within the city of Rialto, and it is the city of Rialto's infrastructure that will be used by the Emhart parties uh, in terms of implementing the interim remedy. What is not so clear from some of the statements you've heard is that you have two settlements before you. And I think it was Mr. Van Vleer who said that any issues that West Valley or Fontana may have are not relevant to its settlement, the first settlement to be negotiated. It's a cash out settlement. It provides money and most importantly to the city of Rialto, money to the city of Rialto among others, um, that and it is a cash out settlement. It is not the work. It is not the, the settlement that requires water rights, if any. Um, and it is not a settlement that impacts anybody else, so far as we know. That's something for the Chief Deputy Director to look at and to make sure that Mr. Zagon is correct in his statement that we believe is true, uh, that none of the parties who are settling, the, the private parties, uh, will get a contribution bar. But that's for Mr. Bishop to look at. What we would like is immediate action insofar as possible. We've already had a delay by the United States, which on November 26th, the comment period ended on the PSI settlement, and they did not immediately move for entry. They will now do so by January 23rd, and we are reluctantly satisfied with that, but we are not happy with the delay of almost two months uh, because it delays us in getting the funds we will otherwise get from the settlement. There is, and I, and I will now use a, a legal term, there is no hair on the PSI settlement. It's clean, it's cash, it's money. And I think EPA uh, will be filing a brief through the Department of Justice stating why it is fair and why it is just in terms of their share, uh, looking at all the legal principles involved. So we would like action on that as soon as possible. With regard to the Emhart decree, we are very pleased that Emhart came forward. Um, you will, in due course, uh, very soon, or, or even today, be able to look at that decree that was the proposed consent decree that was lodged in federal court this morning. And it does call for a substantial amount of work on the interim remedy. We hope that you will look at it and see if it's appropriate from a Porter Cologne point of view. And I must tell you that we believe it is, that it satisfies the objectives, goals, and mandates of the Porter Cologne Water Quality Act. And I will get to that in a moment because there's another issue. Um, and at this time, we support it. But you all have to take a look at it through your chief deputy director. There are some parties that have not settled yet. Goodrich has not settled. They are in negotiations to do so. That is public knowledge. Uh, but we are not internal to that process. Nobody else except the United States is involved in those negotiations. So we don't know where they are. We get. Uh, encouraging words, but you know, until it's done, it's not done. There's one major party that has not settled yet, to the best of my knowledge, called Hescox, which is an estate. Um, and it's a major party that hasn't settled. Uh, to the extent it does not do so, we hope that the state board will keep open uh, its proceedings in case there needs to be further action against that party. The final remedy has not yet been chosen, and that is where Porter Cologne and CERCLA can sometimes diverge in terms of how much is enough. From our point of view, the Porter Cologne is the ultimate water cleanup statute. It requires as much cleanup as possible without some of the balancing criteria used in CERCLA. So as EPA goes forward in choosing the final remedy, we hope that you will be looking at that, and in particular, to the extent that the Goodrich consent decree has to do with the final remedy, which many of us think it will, we hope that you will look at it to make sure that there is full engagement by the state board in determining what is enough cleanup. Because leaving pollution in the ground in the cities of Rialto and Colton is not acceptable from our point of view, and we hope not from yours. The The issue of water rights that you asked Mr. Lawfer about earlier, Chairman Hoppen, um, is certainly a question for all the parties 
because to conduct the interim remedy, it is necessary to pump water out of the ground, treat it, and pump it back in uh, to some, deliver it somewhere since we are not recharging the basin. And um, there can be a debate as to how much water rights, how many water rights or how much water rights are, are, are needed and whether we have them already. Um, and certainly uh, we think that EPA, as far as I can tell, is responsible for assuring that there are sufficient water rights for the remedy. Um, and we are sure that Mr. Bishop will take a look at that when it comes to looking at the MHART decree, perhaps, but hopefully not at the PSI decree, which, as I said, is only a cash out. So with that, all I can say is, uh, from the city of Rialto's point of view, we need the clean water. We want the clean water uh, as soon as possible. It's necessary and appropriate for economic development in the city, but it's also necessary for us to start getting reimbursed for our costs so that we can the City Council already wants to end the uh, high water user fee that is being paid to fund some of these efforts. We need to do that. This is an environmental justice city as determined by the board in 2003. I'd also like to introduce, just if I may, for a couple of minutes, uh, Mr. Ed Scott uh, from the City of Rialto who has been first and foremost in his advocacy on this issue. Mr. Chairman and board members, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Ed Scott. I'm the mayor pro tem of the city of Rialto, and I'm here representing 103,000 residents. Ten years ago, Rialto embarked on a legal battle with a number of PRPs, and our primary purpose was to ensure that our residents had safe, clean drinking water. Today, I can tell you that we are no longer enemies with those PRPs. We are partners, we are working with them, they are working with us to ensure that our residents have safe drinking water. The issue of water rights we believe has been addressed satisfactorily by the responsible parties. We also believe that West Valley at some point will uh, be brought into uh, assist with those water rights. Um, the end use of this treated water will go to our residents. Some of those residents may be served by Fontana Water, some may be served by West Valley, some by Colton, and some by Rialto. But the agencies have worked well together, and um, I, I think we, we are clearly headed in the right direction. I'm here today to ask you to support this resolution ask you to support these settlements so that my residents, 103,000 of them, can move forward and be safe and comfortable that their families, their children, and children to come are drinking safe water, clean water. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have regarding the city of Rialto, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Fred Fudash. I butcher your name there, Fred. It's Fudaz, Mr. Chairman, and thanks so much for uh, letting me speak to you. Um, I'm with Nossaman LLP. I'm here on behalf of Fontana Water Company, and uh, the customers that Fontana serves in the Fontana City, uh, portions of Rialto, portions of Rancho Cucamonga, and unincorporated areas of San Bernardino. I should say I put down five minutes on my uh, card. Maybe the, the you don't have to use it all. Didn't if you don't want. <laughs> anticipate the kind of the flurry of activity we'd get in response to our comment letter. Um, uh, maybe I should go back a little bit and provide a little background and refresh your recollection from our uh, hearing here in July. Um, Fontana Water Company is the largest water supplier in the vicinity of the sources of contamination that we're talking about here today. It serves 210,000 people, and it has a service area of 52 square miles, and it has a massive contamination problem. Uh, many of its wells have uh, contamination. Eleven, a significant proportion of its production capacity, has been shut down because the water produced uh, exceeds the regulatory standard for perchlorate. Uh, 
Um, we're talking about uh, an area that is very diverse and very economically disadvantaged, particularly in this uh, uh, environment we find ourselves in. Um, they simply uh, are being faced with skyrocketing water rates, and they can't afford to uh, pay the additional cost of remediation. Now, comments have been made about the fact that we dismissed our lawsuit. Uh, this whole saga is somewhat storied for just the huge the amount of attorney's fees that have been spent pursuing some sort of remedy, some sort of clue conclusion, tens of millions of dollars. Our client is answerable to the Public Utilities Commission, and they made the decision that they just couldn't justify spending that kind of money pursuing a remedy uh, when there are regulatory agencies in place that uh, are there to assist and should be assisting. So they made that decision early on. So they dismissed that lawsuit seeing kind of the torrent of litigation activity that befell the people that continued with it. Endless discovery, endless depositions, uh, endless document requests. And it went on and on and on, and I needn't remind you about it. We made a very rational decision cons considering our customer base of how to approach this problem. So there's been these settlement discussions, and uh, I, I think everyone's acknowledged that we don't, our client and our customer base doesn't benefit one iota from these settlements. Uh, we don't get any remediation, we don't get wellhead treatment, we don't get any compensation for our loss of production capacity and the need to seek out alternative water supplies. Um, that's the fact of life, and we're sh we've effectively been shut out on the basis that has been articulated here that somehow uh, we're not involved in this. Our uh, claims aren't pertinent to this problem. I would suggest if that is the case, if that's what we're dealing with, doesn't fairness dictate that the matters addressed not include our claims? not include the authority of this board to act on, on our client's behalf and the uh, behalf of our customers. Uh, Sir, we, we've been told that you have no current claims before the court. We don't have any claims before the court. What are the claims you're talking about? Uh, we could have claims. Now let me back up a little bit what we've done. Instead of uh, filing lawsuits, we sought the aid of the regulatory agencies. They told us there wasn't sufficient hydrologic evidence to support uh, the conclusion that uh, our wells had been impacted by this RASP site. So we went to Congress and we were instrumental in securing money to study the problem in a, a comprehensive way, to do a hydrologic study, to do an isotope study, to help uh, uh, discern whether our exclusion from this process was warranted or not. And the results of those studies aren't in yet. Uh, we still await the isotope results for the critical wells that are at issue here for Fontana Water. And also, we await the published results of the hydrologic study. If you go back to 2006, when the regional board issued its uh, cleanup and abatement order, that effectively excluded us from this process. The fundamental supposition of that order was there was a fault zone that lay between the impacted wells of Fontana Water Company and the RASP site that is the source of the perchlorate at issue. I think it's fair to say that supposition that this was some sort of Maginot line preventing the contamination from flowing to our wells has uh, been undermined substantially. We've found already from the preliminary results of that hydrologic study that there's reason to believe that this isn't an impenetrable barrier. And there certainly is the possibility that the perchlorate from these sites are impacting our wells. So given that fact, given the effort we made to try to secure real evidence, you know, I would suggest it's not fair to compromise our rights in any way, but more importantly, not to compromise the authority of this board. Recently, you may have followed it, uh, 
there was some legislation passed uh, by our legislature, the so-called right to water legislation that was signed by the governor and is now section 106.3 of the water code. That suggests that every citizen, uh, no matter what their economic circumstances, has a right to clean and affordable water. And if that, mean, if that statute means anything, I would suggest that it means that this board has the obligation to keep an open mind on this issue and to keep its options open to weigh all the evidence and secure a remedy that's totally appropriate once all the facts are known. Uh, wh when do you expect to get the results of your isotope study and your hydrology? Well, that's a very hydrology. good question. Um, you should be aware that I, I went into this isotope study with some trepidation because um, it's funded effectively by ESTCP, which is a, uh, an adjunct of the DOD, which is now one of the key proposed uh, settling parties for the final remedy. Um, but they've pursued this, and we, uh, you know, we lined up an expert witness at uh, Caltech, a Dr. John Eiler, who we arranged to do split samples so that we could confirm that this um, uh, work is done in a satisfactory way. We, we still await those results. We still await the split samples. The last time I checked in with the managers of the study, they were talking towards the end of December. They might have some additional data, but we're still waiting. Uh, we still uh, want the opportunity to check those results. Uh, Dr. Eiler isn't, uh, you know, he's one of these people that gets the information from the uh, uh, the Mars Curiosity Explorer uh, and uh, tries to discern what kind of isotopes there are on, on Mars. He's one of the leading experts in the whole world on it. We want to give him the opportunity to check these out. But assuming all that takes place in a reasonable time, certainly by the middle of next year, we should have a better idea of what's going on. In any case, um, you should understand that Fontana Water Company its customers did not cause this contamination. Uh, it's undisputed that a significant percentage of our production capacity has been sidelined because of this problem. And uh, we've gotten no effective help from any regulatory agency, no matter what the cost may turn out to be. And that's all we're asking for. Uh, and we welcome the opportunity to work with the regional board uh, and work with the chief deputy uh, director to work out satisfactory language. If we're not part of this problem, what is the big issue with excluding our wells from matters addressed? If, if this contamination isn't getting to our wells, there should be no problem with saying, okay, that, you know, that's a separate issue. That's the premise of this settlement, that Fontana's issues are distinct and separate from the issues that we're settling. It seems to me that's only a matter of basic fairness. And that's all we ask from this board. Thank you. Unless there's questions, that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Christopher Johnson. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the board. My name is Christopher Johnson. I represent Whitaker Corporation. I, I may not be the most appropriate uh, person to follow up on uh, Mr. Fudez. Um, my comments are related to the fact that uh, Whitaker Corporation is one of the signatories to the work party consent decree that was just lodged this morning. And uh, I, uh, we stand behind the comments that Mr. Meter made as well as the comments of mm -hmm. Mr. Zagon, Mr. Van Vleer, and Mr. Weiner. Um, Whitaker's only uh, 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 comment here is that uh, the work consent decree includes with it, you know, MHART parties being the work parties, a number of cash out parties, and Whitaker is one of those parties. And the way that consent decree is structured, uh, the, these cash out parties, Whitaker included, uh, are contributing significant amounts of money that are going to EPA and the cleanup effort, going to the cities, um, and that uh, we, we uh, Whitaker encourages the board to uh, uh, pass this resolution so that uh, uh, this process can, can keep going along to the way it has been structured with EPA and uh, being led by EPA and the regional board um, and to, to follow that structure and to try to get uh, all these issues resolved. And uh, I, I'm open to any questions from the board. 
Thank you, sir. David Lawton. Good afternoon, Mr. Cham Chairman and members of the board. I'm David Lawton. I represent the County of San Bernardino. Uh, we support the resolution and we would ask that you do as well. Uh, I want to just address uh, the questions about Fontana. <clears throat> Specifically, uh, Mr. Zagon and Mr. Meter laid out the facts and I would agree with those facts as they've laid them out. That's the history as I know it. That's how, how we've gotten here today. Um, the administrative settlement, agree settlement agreement that's before you does not provide a contribution bar. The difference between the carve out that was provided for Fontana in the county's earlier consent decree was that did provide a contribution bar. So through negotiations, there was a carve out because there was a contribution bar in that consent decree. So it was addressed. In this administrative settlement agreement, there, there is no contribution bar. It doesn't need to be addressed here. So it, it couldn't be more simple than that. It just, it's, it's not a contribution bar, so it's not in here. I'll, I'll be brief. If you have any questions for me, I'll answer them or try to. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Karen or James or Michael, um, adopting the the resolution, it, you know, sets us on a on a what looks like a pretty good path to resolving at least some of the issues that uh, that are uh, that surround this case. The, the, how are we planning? How are we going to or are we going to be able to handle? Whatever happens with Goodrich, that seems to be outside this. This and then, is there anything that I mean? I this, the idea that there is no bar to Fontana pursuing something once they get all the data that they have contracted for. Is there something that they it can can do, or that the regional board can do, or that if, you know? <laughs> it, no one wants to seem to address the, the empty spots <laughs> in this, in all of this. So let me first address the issue with respect to Goodrich. I mean, as both myself and others have described, there are at least three different settlement agreements that are contemplated. Um, the way that I read the resolution that is before you today is that uh, First of all, I think there's a, a pretty straightforward path for the PSI. I mean, as it's been described by several um, parties today, it really is just a, a cash out for some of the smaller potentially responsible parties. And, you know, I think that that one would move pretty quickly with the chief deputy's um, approval once the board approved the resolution. With respect to the others, there are some issues that we might want to roll up our sleeves on because, as I indicated before, the state board advisory team has not been involved. Um, you know, certainly reading between the lines, I can understand how people got to the point that they are with the existing settlement agreement that's before us. We don't have a settlement agreement before us for the MHART work group parties yet. Um, and so we'd have to look at that and make sure that, you know, how it flows with this. And, you know, my, my sense is unless your chief deputy or myself as chief counsel to the board has any real concerns with that, um, we would probably not be bringing anything back to the board on the MHART settlement. Likewise, with the Goodrich settlement, if things, if it does come to fruition and, you know, we get to a point where we're negotiating something that's close to this and we think we've worked through some of the issues to the satisfaction of the chief deputy and myself, and obviously we would keep the board apprised of what's going on, I would not anticipate that anything would come back to the board in the future. Unless we reach a point where, simply put, you know, the chief deputy is not satisfied that we can, can reach a, a settlement on this, uh, cannot bring either the MHART or the Goodrich uh, settlement agreement to fruition, we would bring it